Hello, everyone, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I am Tanuja Kopal, and I would like to welcome all of you to this special webinar which is being hosted by the scientist to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the discovery of the PCR. We are delighted to have with us the person who is responsible for bringing uh, PCR to us, Dr. K uh, Kerry Mullis himself. Dr. Mullis received uh, the, the Nobel Prize in 1993 for this discovery, and he is here today to take us back in time and share some of his experiences on the remarkable journey that led to the discovery of PCR. We also have with us Dr. Stephen Bustin, who has been very actively involved in the drafting of the MIKEY guidelines for PCR, and he will be talking to us about those guidelines and the present state of PCR, including some of the challenges and opportunities it, it presents. And finally, to offer us a glimpse into the future with the, ad, uh, with the advent of digital PCR, we have Dr. Reginald Beer from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So we have three really interesting perspectives reflecting on the past, present, and future of PCR from people who are really pioneers in this field. I would very much like for all of you to take advantage of this unique opportunity to interact with our experts in real time by posing questions, expressing your thoughts and ideas, or even any concerns that you are facing in your lab today. You can communicate with me anytime during the webinar by typing in your comments or questions into the question box, which is on the left-hand side of your screen. We will be spending some time after all the speaker presentations are done to discuss some of the issues that you bring up with us. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Biosearch Technologies, for supporting this event. Biosearch Technologies is a manufacturer of um, sophisticated oligonucleotides for research and molecular diagnostics. Since the company was founded back in 1993, it has been at the forefront of advancing nucleic acid technology with the invention of fluorophores and uh, a series, a dye series to be included in customized, in custom synthesized probe formats for real-time quantitative PCR and for other genomic-based applications. A few other reminders for all of you online. Uh, you can expand the slide window to maximize the visibility of the text on your screen. Uh, today's webinar will be archived on the scientist's website, and we will be sending you the link to access that archive within a few days. Uh, but please note that you will not be able to download any slides from our website. For a copy of the slides, you will have to reach out to our speakers directly, and we will provide you their email addresses in our closing slide. And finally, to make things uh, fun and interactive, we will be sending out a few uh, uh, polling questions, in fact, one before and after each talk. Uh, your participation on the polls is greatly appreciated, as this will give us a better insight into what all of you out there are working on and what you might be interested in learning about. So with that, why don't we uh, send out the first polling question? Uh, we would like to know, what is your current area of interest? Are you online there working on basic research uh, on, in human diagnostics, veterinary diagnostics, are you working with bacteria, viruses, or other microbial targets? Or are you into agriculture, food safety, environmental, or some such uh, application? So all you have to do is uh, click on the circle right next to the response um, that is applicable to you, and uh, we'll, we'll tabulate the results. You just have a few seconds to do that, and we will be closing the poll soon. So. Why don't we take a quick peek at what our audience out there is uh, working on? All right, so I think it's a it's an even split between a lot of different applications. Uh, very few of you working on the veterinary side, but otherwise, we have a, a nice diversity of audience um, that we are talking to today. So that's that's always you know welcome. So thank you for that uh, input, and let me now welcome our first speaker, Dr. Kerry Mullis. Dr. Mullis received a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology and a PhD in biochemistry from the University of California in Berkeley. Dr. Mullis then joined Cetus Corporation in California as a DNA chemist in 1979. It was during his seven years there that he conducted research on oligonucleotide synthesis and invented the PCR. He is currently the Chief Scientific Officer um, of Intermune Technologies. Welcome, Dr. Mullis, and I very much appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, hello to all of you out there. Uh, 
polymerase chain reaction is now a word in Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. And if you put PCR into Google, you get uh, it changes, but 40, 41 million hits, I think is the last time I checked. If you type in PCR song, you get a lovely little ditty courtesy of BioRed, which will rattle around in your brain like an insane cat in your garage. Just try it. Um, when I stumbled on PCR in the spring of 1983, I was trying to increase the demand for oligonucleotides. Before automation, my lab in Emeryville, California, had made these by hand. Our new machine, developed by my friend Ron Cook at Biosurge across the San Francisco Bay, had threatened job security in the lab by doing what had taken us about three weeks to do in only eight hours. There were seven of us. And it did it every eight hours, no breaks. My, my attempt succeeded. The demand went up immeasurably, and I didn't have to fire any of my fellow lab workers at CETUS. It was, a, it was spring in 1983, and I was driving up a long and winding road called Highway 128 between Cloverdale and Boonville in Mendocino County. My girlfriend was asleep in the passenger seat, and I was heading for my weekend cabin. I was functionally sober, or the road would have proven my undoing. But it was late at night, and I was feeling weird. Strange things had happened to me on 128 before. I once saw a furtive old man in a gray robe in a field. Or did I? Or I had that distinct feeling of lost time, shared by my former wife and I as we pulled into Boonville once, thinking we had just left Cloverdale, now 35 miles to the southeast. It was that kind of road, and tonight, in the middle of that stretch at mile marker 46.58, the rest of my life was going to undergo a massive shift in just a few minutes. Oligonucleotides are amazing little things, but using just one, it is not possible to physically locate a particular spot on human DNA. If the human DNA genome were random, a 17 nucleotide oligomer would uniquely specify a position along the six to seven billion bases in denatured human DNA. But it's not random, and any 17 17 mer that is in there is probably in there more than once, or at least some slightly different version of it is in there. In the early 80s, if you look at gels of whole human DNA broken into restriction fragments and probed with 20 mers, you saw a lot of smears. There were no sharp bands like the restriction digest of bacteriophage DNA that you could use as markers. Those were sharp. But if you wanted to examine a human DNA sequence closely, you had to clone it. Chop up the DNA into pieces of several thousand base pairs. Isolate each of those by growing them in a particular bacterial colony. Figure out which colony contains your favorite piece. Pick it off a plate and grow it up. That was the magic of cloning, and it was magic. We all knew it. Even the janitors pushing the booms through the laboratories at night could feel it. No one knew exactly what lay ahead. In the late 70s, just as I started working for a biotech company called Cetus, a number of prominent molecular biologists convinced the rest of the field to hold off a little, to ponder the safety issues. Conferences were called. Laws were even passed in Cambridge and Berkeley. Cetus was safely in Emeryville, where there were gambling houses, but not so many laws. No one could be sure that putting human genes into microorganisms that could possibly infect humans was a good idea. They never did figure it out, but by way of compromising, some strains of E. coli were designated to be more unlikely than others to be catastrophically destructive to humans and we agreed to use only these. 
E. coli K12, for instance. And it, did, it didn't solve my problem with the new oligonucleotide synthesis machine, nor did it solve the problem of rapidly determining whether or not the DNA of a growing fetus contained an unfortunate mutation in order to give the parents an opportunity to elect an abortion. Unconsciously combining the two problems, I started devising methods whereby oligonucleotides could be used to determine single base pair mutations from whole human DNA. Pregnant mothers should not have to wait for the cloners, and the result of running gels and using radioactive probes on genomic DNA were fuzzy for the reasons mentioned above. Fuzzy is not a comfortable basis for making a life or death decision. Somebody needed to come up with a way to concentrate a single DNA locus in the presence of millions of similar but different DNA loci without the inevitable delay of cloning. It was going to happen tonight. That somebody was going to be me. In 10 years, I would be toasting the health of the Swedish royals in Stockholm, grinning from ear to ear at my good fortune. The California Buckeyes poked heavy blossoms out into Highway 128. The pink and white stalks hanging down into my headlights looked cold, but they were loaded with warmed oils that dominated the dimension of smell. It seemed to be the night of the Buckeyes, that something else was stirring. My little silver Honda's front tires pulled us through the mountains. My hands felt the road and the turns. My mind drifted back into the lab. DNA chains coiled and floated. Lurid blue and pink images of electric molecules injected themselves somewhere between the mountain road and my eyes. I see the lights on the trees, but most of me is watching something else unfolding. If you were to attempt to extend by just one base a synthetic oligonucleotide, prepared to be complementary to a target on human DNA using DNA polymerase and dideoxynucleoside triphosphates using four different tubes, each containing all four bases, but only one of them in each tube labeled with P32. Optimistically, one might be able to discover the identity of the nucleotide on the DNA target, just three prime of the oligomer. Dideoxy sequencing worked that way, but huge, huge but. That only worked on clone DNA where the ratio of target to non-target DNA was increased by a factor of about a million. Fortunately for me, I was thinking about other things that might go wrong than just the brute improbability that only the right sequence would be engaged. I paid just enough attention to this hypothetical problem to plan on using two oligonucleotides, one designed for each strand of the target sequence coming at the base pair in question from either side. Although these two sides would be far distant in the denatured reaction mixture, they would still represent complementary strands. If one told me that a T was three prime to one oligo, the other should have told me A was three prime to the other. Not, not much of a control, but I had oligos to burn. In fact, that was what I was trying to do since we had an excess of oligos on our hands. I was worried about another possible problem. What if the DNA sample coming as it did from a person's tissue was contaminated with deoxynucleoside triphosphates? That was very likely. And the sad fact was that DNA polymerase was not terribly fond of dideoxys when the natural substrate was around. It was very likely it would add a few deoxynucleotides to the proffered oligomer before getting around to the dideoxys, labeled or not. This could destroy the simplicity I was hoping for, a test that could be completed in one shift in a hospital laboratory. I started thinking of ways to get rid of any possible stray nucleotides in the sample before I did the experiment. 
There were at least three misconceptions driving me towards PCR. I was very close, but I didn't know what I was close to. I don't think normal people can look directly at something that is going to have a huge effect on them. We are better creeping up from the side. I had a misconception that I was just solving some little technical detail. Good. I didn't clutch. My second misconception was that the procedure I was planning would even work at all. The probabilities of the complexity of the sample, which PCR was going to solve very shortly, were very much against it. I drove on. A third misconception was more subtle and was shared by my colleagues. There is an enzyme that could have disposed of the hypothetical stray deoxynucleotide triphosphates, bacterial alkaline phosphatase. It would clip off their little triphosphate tails in a flash, but then I would have to get rid of it before I added my precious dideoxys, or it would clip off their tails too. Everyone knew that BAP, as we referred to it, or BAP, could not be irreversibly heat denatured, so you couldn't get rid of it easily. The discovery of the natural renaturation of heat denatured BAP was famous. It established that the three-dimensional structure of a protein would refold based on its sequence alone. There was a product called Mat BAP on the market to get rid of BAP after it was no longer desired in a reaction. But having, by having the protein attached to an insoluble matrix, I had never had any luck with this product. None of us in the field realized that if you take a microliter of BAP from a commercial supply and use it quickly before it loses its zinc atom into a buffer that contains no appreciable zinc, it will work for a short time, but then it will be subject to irreversible heat denaturation. I discovered that much later, but I was fortunate not to know it at the time. The famous refolding experiment was done in a high zinc buffer. So I considered other ways to get rid of the, di di of the deoxynucleotide triphosphates. Clinow, that would polymerize them. Given an oligomer to start with and some single-stranded DNA for a template, Clinow was the polymerase that I had planned to use anyhow. So how clever. I would use it twice for two purposes. First, I would denature my sample separated into four tubes, add the primers I would later use in the main event, bring to 37 degrees, and wait. The polymerase should polymerize all the nucleotides. I would heat the mixture to remove the oligos that may have been extended indefinitely now, cool to 37 degrees, add some more polymerase, which would have been denatured by the heat, and add the labeled dideoxynucleotides. I had it, PCR, but I didn't see it yet. There would be an excess, a vast excess of oligomers, and now fresh ones would land on the target strands and hopefully be extended by one radioactive nucleotide. What could go wrong? What if the oligomers in the get rid of the triphosphate step had been extended a long way? Eureka. I very quickly brought the Honda to a stop near the road's edge, but sticking out into the potential logging trucks that could come around the bend, I contemplated what would happen if they had been extended a long way. Their extension products would be primed by the other oligos, and these would also now be extended. I would have doubled the signal, and I could do that over and over and I could add a tremendous excess of my own deoxynucleoside triphosphates as they are cheap, soluble, and legal in California. <laughs> With my invention, my, and my girlfriend and me in peril from speeding logging trucks, I realized I'd better get out of the road. A few hundred yards down Highway 128 was a pullout. By the time I got there, the rest of the invention had fallen grandly into place. 
I could design the oligos not adjacent to each other, but some distance from each other. After three cycles, they would make a double-stranded DNA molecule corresponding exactly to the DNA template between them, and that would double in concentration every subsequent cycle. Anything else that happened would be of no concern. After 10 cycles, I would have 1,000. I knew my powers of two. As I wrote computer programs, I understood the power of reiterative loops. 30 cycles would be somewhere around a billion. The product would overwhelm anything that was unintended because it would be self-catalytic, and only the site of interest would bind the necessary two oligos together in their little reproductive dance. I, I didn't sleep that night. The next morning, I bought two bottles of Navarro Vineyards, Vineyards Pinot Noir, and by mid-afternoon had settled into a fitful sleep. There were diagrams of PCR reactions on every surface that would take pencil or crayon in my cabin. I woke up in a new world. Thank you, Dr. Mullis. I, sorry, I was just, I was just pulled into this story of yours, and I wish every paper that's written out there is written in such a colorful fashion. Um, and uh, hearing, hearing about a discovery is wonderful. Hearing it from the person who actually made the discovery, it's, it's priceless. Um, so thank you for taking the time and uh, sharing your wonderful journey with us. Um, a couple of questions that have come in, and I think uh, they deserve an answer. <laughs> uh, one question is, what happened to those original posters and gel images? Uh, where do they reside right now? The original poster and gel images? I've got a few, uh, a few of the original things, but unfortunately, well, fortunately in a way, there was a, a, a legal case that involved uh, PCR and I don't know. There was a couple of companies that were fighting over it, and and my my notebooks, which had uh, all the notes of this particular invention, uh, were grabbed by the lawyers and stuck into filing cabinets at the basement of some horrible building somewhere, and no one, including some of the lawyers that were involved in those cases have ever been able to figure out where they are and why, in fact, they can't be restored to my own collection. But, oh, my goodness. Well, we you have know, people from the audience saying, saying, yeah, I know we have people from the audience saying that it should be, you know, on display in the Smithsonian. And, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, th these, these are priceless. So I hope you can get your hands on them someday. I do, um, too. Yeah. I have some really crappy copies of them, like Xeroxes <laughs> of them, but... Not the real thing. I mean, I had. They were. I would love to have them back. I'd stick them in the Smithsonian. That would be a good idea. Yeah. Um, and then we have somebody else saying that uh, he was with you in Cold Spring Harbor celebrating the 10th anniversary along with yourself and I think Dr. Watson. So he's saying that well, time flies, and I, I agree. Uh, it's um, that's you know we are. Time is a battle that none of us can, uh, I guess, conquer. But uh, it's good to have people like that online. And again, as I said, just hearing the story from you and also being able to, thanks to technology, uh, getting your voice across to people outside of the United States and uh, you know across the world, I think it's, um, it's very, very valuable. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. It was fun. No, thank you so much. And then uh, the other question is, where did your paper finally get published after being rejected? By oh, that's a great story. I could go on and on. But, you know, uh, disruptive technologies oftentimes get rejected by very high-class journals. And this one uh, managed to get rejected by Nature, which was my favorite magazine, and Science. It also finally got published. Ray Wu was a, was a uh, uh, advisor to CETUS. And he's one of the people that recognized that this, this was a pretty cool thing and ought to be published right away. And he was preparing a, a methods in entomology volume at the time. And he said, why don't you put it in there? You wanna, I won't make you mess around with it. Or, you know, Because I, I was kind of tired of revising it for 
journalists that seemed to know nothing of what they were doing. So, yeah, it went into methods in entomology. Mm, very interesting. Okay. Uh, well, there's so many, so many comments that have come in. I, I don't think we can possibly get to each one of them, but um, you know, there's uh, there's somebody saying, I hope the invention reaches a point where you know PCR kits are available for less than ten dollars, so we <laughs> uh, in in developing countries can actually you know use it uh, on a more routine basis. So, uh, well, here's to that, and um, hopefully, if we open another bottle of Pinot Noir, we might get there someday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mullis. Um, let's send thank out you, another Nancy. quick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, let's send out a quick poll again to see because PCR has now evolved to multiplexing, and so we are curious to find out uh, if there are people out there who are looking at multiplexing qPCR. What are your dye requirements? Do you use uh, two dyes, three dyes, four dyes, five dyes, or even greater than five dyes? So. Um, please take a moment to click on the response, and um, like the previous time, we'll quickly tabulate the results. And also wanted to remind everybody that you will not be able to download any presentation from the website, but you can reach out to our speakers, and we will be giving you the email addresses at the end of the webinar. So let's see what our results look like. Okay, so you know, majority of you are still uh, using two and three dyes and haven't progressed you know, further enough to do that much multiplexing. But uh, we will get to that later on in our presentations when we will hear sort of more futuristic applications. Um, so let's turn it over now to our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Buston, who obtained his PhD in molecular genetics from Trinity, Trinity College um, at the University of Dublin. He is currently professor of allied health and medicine at um, Angelia Ruskin University in the UK. Uh, having previously been Professor of Molecular Science at Queen Mary, University of London. Uh, Dr. Buston is also a visiting Professor of Molecular Biology at uh, University of Middlesex. And uh, as all, you know, many of you may know, he has authored the book A to Z of qPCR, which is uh, referred to as uh, uh, really the qPCR Bible. And he has edited other books as well, and some of the first e-books that are dedicated to uh, qPCR um, so welcome to the webinar, Dr. Bustin, and uh, delighted to have you on the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening or good afternoon. Um, it really was fascinating to see this um, image of uh, the very first PCR Amplicon and uh, all the trouble it has caused us since. This year, we are also celebrating the 21st birthday of real-time quantitative PCR, as it is 21 years ago since Rossi Gucci published this groundbreaking paper. Now, 21 years is a very long time, and this brought home to me when my eldest daughter, who was also born in 1992, recently graduated. So, conventional PCR is an endpoint assay with only a loose correlation between the amount of starting material and the band intensity following gel electrophoresis. This makes it an excellent method for qualitative detection of nucleic acids, but uh, causes some problems if you're interested in quantitative analysis. qPCR combines the amplification and detection steps into a single step and then measures the accumulation of fluorescent signal during the exponential phase of the PCR reaction. And if this is done appropriately, it can be quantitative. The lack of correlation between the amount of initial target and endpoint fluorescence is clearly demonstrated here where the real-time detection of three replicas gives identical results in contrast to the amount of endpoint fluorescence. qPCR can be quantitative because a log, a plot of the log of initial template concentration against the quantification cycle when the target is first detected highlights the linear, uh, uh, allows you to get a linear and a wide dynamic range of qPCR and therefore all, and also provides information with regards to its efficiency. Now, there are numerous applications for qPCR, which can be used to quantify RNA, DNA, and proteins. And the use of qPCR to detect proteins deserves to be more widely known as it complements its use for establishing RNA expression profiles. And I just want to spend a second or two discussing this. So the proximity ligation assay, which was developed by Mark Shannon, David Ruff, and colleagues at Life Technologies, uses two pools of antibodies, 
that are labelled with biotin and are coupled to, to different oligonucleotides. Both target different epitopes on the same antigen. It's going forward, yeah. In the presence of antigen, the proximity of the two antibodies also brings the oligonucleotides together, and the short bridging oligonucleotide juxtaposes their respective 5' prime and 3' prime ends. A ligation step seals the gap and generates a continuous DNA sequence that can be targeted and amplified by qPCR. The output from all of this is familiar, as shown in this amplification plot, which was generated by my PhD student, Gemma Johnson. Now, reliable and biologically meaningful qPCR requires a series of steps that involve the sample, various quality control aspects, appropriate experimental design, the assay itself, correct data analysis, and finally, publication of the results. In today's talk, I want to focus on the use of qPCR for the quantification of RNA, which is its most prevalent and, as we shall see, also least reliable application. There are six parameters that define a reverse transcription PCR quantification, and I would like to begin by demonstrating how these are being disregarded. RNA integrity is an obvious starting point, since any variability here will affect conclusions derived from using that material. Now, many researchers believe that there is no need to quality assess RNA obtained from tissue culture cells. And I'm grateful, grateful to Peter Bradachnik, who now has allowed me to use these data. And they demonstrate why even tissue culture RNA must be quality assessed. He grew up cells with and without estrogen and extracted his RNA using the same method, except that in one case he trypsinized his cells and the other he did not. Now, conventional quality assessment criteria show nothing untoward, but further analysis clearly demonstrated that uh, one of the preparations, i.e. the trypsinized preparation, was totally degraded. So this is, of course, cause a problem in the interpretation of the data. The conversion of RNA into cDNA prior to the PCS, PCR step has been a topic of many discussion and is associated with the effects of variable performance of reverse transcriptases, again leading to variable results. Results from RTQPCR assays obtained using 13 different reverse transcriptases shows the range of CQs recorded, which, even if the worst two performing enzymes are excluded, ranges over a 40-fold difference, 5.5 CQs. Now, for many people, sensitivity is neither here nor there, but linearity is very important. And perhaps more importantly, some RTs are much more linear than others. Here we, have, we would expect a difference between the preparations of 2.3 CQs. And again, it is obvious that there are significant differences in the performance of various RTs. Hence, the choice of the most appropriate RT for the task at hand is important, and informing um, the reader, readership and uh, um, informing people in a publication as to uh, what enzyme has been used uh, is, of course, also important if they want to reproduce these data. The next point is primer specificity, and this, of course, is of fundamental importance to any qPCR experiment. It has never fails to surprise me how many publications appear using primers that are clearly not fit for purpose. Here's an example, a publication in the High Impact Factor Journal, and uh, it aims to demonstrate the association of a truncated mRNA with metastasis in breast cancer. I have color-coded the primers, and you can see that the forward primer bridges the deleted sequence and is used to generate a splice variant specific amplicon. However, an evaluation with primer blast shows mismatches at the five prime end of that forward primer. This is puzzling since, as you can see, I've aligned the sequence. Clearly, the sequence is correct. It turns out that, that there's an alternative primer binding site. Sorry. It turns out. There's an alternative primer binding site here, um, which is um, uh, at the, within the deleted uh, mRNA, and um, this is highly likely to interfere with the reliability of this assay. Now, just to show another example, here's a very nice qPCR experiment, a very recent one, as you can see, where uh, the probe, a 
apparently binds to a sequence that is outside the PCR amplicon. So you do wonder how um, they, these authors ever managed to get a result at all. So let's look at PCR efficiency. The, the exponential nature of the PCR reaction makes it important not to compare data obtained using assays with, with, with wildly different amplification efficiencies. Here's a publication that claims to have found a disease-associated role for a virus and presents data implying impossibly high amplification efficiencies, which are then used to report relative expression of viral RNA against the human reference gene. Clearly, this is not possible. Regardless of how a QPCI experiment is carried out, the data analysis provides another opportunity for misinterpretation of results, and one of the problems is the expectation that's associated with QPCR data. A very simple experiment here, uh, looking at uniformity across the block of a PCR instrument, and the behavior is probably due to micropetting, but on the face of it, the results are very precise, with a tiny coefficient of variation. However, the problem here is, and you see this in many papers, Plotting of CQs is misleading, since these are exponential data and need to be converted into copy numbers or certain into linear scale to give a true picture of their variability. If you do this, you get these results, and while the CV is 8% and still quite very good, it is significantly tenfold greater than what you would get if you just plotted CQ. So this is something to bear in mind. Now, more importantly, normalization is one of those things is one of the most debated aspects of data analysis. Mm -hmm. And in 2002, Joe van der Zompel made one of his many outstanding contributions to QPCR when he demonstrated the need for proper selection and validation of reference genes. Unfortunately, even today, most papers continue to use single unvalidated reference genes for data normalization. And again, here's a nice example of what people tend to do. A high impact factor journal showing um, a potentially important um, association with a uh, oncogene with um, a potassium channel expression regulation. And uh, this paper has used a single reference gene, beta microglobulin, microglobulin and uh, no reason given as to why, and no, even though they use the delta-delta CQ method, no information about the efficiency of the PCR. However, it is interesting that seven years before this paper was published, another paper showed that beta-2 microglobulin is not a very good end, uh, a reference gene since its expression is, is regulated by estrogen. So again, you'd have to qu question the validity of the data produced, uh, reported in this publication. So here we have a small-scale um, survey of uh, papers that su suggest three conclusions. Most papers do not report sufficient detail to allow a reader to judge the technical merit of that paper. Secondly, they use inappropriate normalization strategy, and this is, applies especially to high impact factor publications. And we have a large comprehensive survey which is looking at this in far more detail, and it's been currently reviewed for publication. Now, why does all of this matter? One important reason is that qPCR data can affect people's lives. There has been an enormous amount of angst regarding the role or a possible role of the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine in the development of autism. A qPCR-based paper claimed to have discovered an association between measles virus and gut pathology in autistic children, and I was an expert witness during the autism omnibus trial in Washington, D.C., and I was able to show that the author's conclusions were based on extremely poorly executed qPCR experiment. experiments. There was clear evidence of gross contamination, results could not be reproduced, and even though measles virus exists only as an RNA molecule in nature, the authors were able to amplify their target regardless of whether they included an RT step or not. So my, my involvement with this case, which was very high profile both here in the UK and the United States, was the final inspiration for attempting to establish a set of guidelines to help research, uh, researchers publish more reliable qPCR results and these are known as the Mikey Guidelines. These were published in 2009 with a number of highly respected international researchers coming together to propose a set of parameters that would help with transparency of reporting and could serve as a blueprint for good assay design. The publication includes a checklist which describes the key parameters 
and they range from sample handling to data analysis. And some of these parameters may be surprising, um, but instruments, for example, uh, do matter, as I show in my next slide. We have two instruments, and the identical assays, the identical master mixes were loaded into two different uh, instruments, and as you can see, there's significant variation in the results we obtained. Now, this isn't the norm, but this can happen, and that, that is one of the reasons why we felt it was important that people indicate which instruments they use uh, when they do their QPCRs. Now, if these data are then used to, um, to assess mRNA levels, it is obvious that contradictory results are being obtained. For instrument A, there's no obvious difference in the expression of eta terin or beta catenin, whereas if the same, same mass mixes are run on, on instrument B, there are significant differences there. So clearly a source of, 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 of discordance. There is a need to optimize any assay, and it doesn't matter whether it's commercial, whether it's taken from a publication or newly designed. But even something as apparently simple as the optimal annealing temperature needs to be established empirically. Annealing temperatures are conventionally around 5% lower than melting temperatures. However, what is the correct uh, melting temperature for a set of oligonucleotides? Here we have two oligonucleotides which differ by three, uh, oligonucleotides which differ by three nucleotides. Predictions for their melting temperature taken from various online programs vary considerably and making, makes it difficult to decide which is the appropriate TA to use. Empirical documentation um, will demonstrate very clearly that the true TMs of both oligos are nowhere near the predicted ones. Uh, these are two replicate results giving, giving the same uh, experiments giving the same results. So, so this is one of the reasons why it is important to have some idea as to what the optimal annealing temperature for, your, for an oligonucleotide is, because it helps improve the reliability of the PCR, thereby reduces variability and allows other people to be more successful in reproducing uh, data. So, the importance of MIKI has now been recognized, and initiatives have been supported by all major manufacturers uh, of instruments as well as reagents, and is also being reflected in the number of citations in the peer-reviewed literature, which is approaching the 2000 mark now. What I would like to emphasize, though, is that MIKI is not a set of rules designed to provoke a confrontation. So we don't have the situation on the left where we feel that we have to tell people how to do things. Instead, there are common sense suggestions, and much more akin to a friendly chat, trying to explain why it is important to do certain things, and let people understand for themselves why it is in, in, in all of our interest that people report exactly what they do and do things in a consistent and uh, reproducible way. It turns out that um, uh, the long crusade we've been fighting has now been recognized by and journals such as Nature, and I thought it was ironic to see Carrie's um, description of, of, of Nature's initial response to his um, discovery. Um, and uh, earlier this year, Nature published uh, an admission in an editorial that they have been neglecting um, the methods and the reporting of methods and scrutiny of methods uh, in, in Nature and, and associated journals. So, unfortunately, the MITRE guidelines were published a long time after the invention of QPCR. So with digital PCR on the horizon, um, we decided to try and get ahead of the curve, and early this year, um, digital MITRE guidelines have been published, which we hope will prevent mad practices corrupting this rapidly developing technology. So in summary, it is clear that qPCR um, is uh, a very, very important molecular technology that allows accurate, sensitive, and rapid measurement of nucleic acids as well as proteins. However, its usefulness continues to be limited by technical and biological variability of the same, um, the, the same type of variability that we know have been known for the last 15 years or so. So something needs to be done about this. And Mikey is one of these, uh, is, is an important um, tool, I think, that helps people uh, improve and the, both the design and the carrying out of the experiments, as well as the reporting of the assays. It is, it is important to remember that QPCR requires validation of every step of the workflow, and that if you follow MITRE guidelines, there will be a transparent, robust assay. Now, and this is where we are today. Where are we heading? 
but I think we're heading towards faster and smaller volumes. And we are currently working with an instrument, which is this instrument here. And as you can see, the plates are fused directly to an aluminium uh, conductor, which uh, contains the electrodes that then uh, passes current uh, through the aluminium and heats and cools the plate. And um, we can achieve, uh, well, it's not our instrument, we, we're using it at the moment, but we have been down to eight second cycles. So we can do our PCRs in, in less than five, five minutes now. And if you combine this with smaller volumes, and at the moment you can get up to 96 well plates, you can see how you can have very important implications for, for molecular diagnostics, where speed uh, is of the essence. So um, this is where certainly qPCR has, has a, an exciting future. I'm absolutely certain of this. Now, obviously, I've not been able to tell you everything I wanted to tell you, so I'm leaving you with uh, some uh, information which uh, is available online. And if you're interested in, in, in any further information, then um, I, I suggest that you look at some of these websites um, uh, that will help you uh, understand and perhaps uh, develop uh, ideas and better assays for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bustin. And um, again, if you have questions, maybe it's a time to just type it in and uh, send it along to us. We definitely cannot get to all the questions because um, you know there is a time constraint here. But we'll to try we'll try and get to as many as possible. And I promise that we will also uh, send the questions along to the speaker. So you know, when, as and when they get a chance, they can reply back to you directly. Um, maybe at this point, it might be useful to find out if you have heard of Mikey guidelines. So why don't we do a quick poll? Um, have you heard of Mikey guidelines? No. Have you you have heard about it, but you have not fully understood it, or perhaps you have heard about it but not found it useful? And perhaps there are some people out there who, you know, know about Mikey guidelines and do adhere to them very rigorously. I'm sure uh, all of you and also uh, Dr. Bustin would be curious to find out uh, which category you fall into. So all you have to do is just click on that uh, little circle right next to the response and. Uh, Let's uh, take a quick look at the results in a couple of seconds. So Dr. Bustin, what do you think? Not many people, actually nearly half of the, the people in the audience have not heard about Mikey guidelines. So having you talk about it, I guess, was a good thing. Um, but then there's a good split between people who have understood it, I mean, heard about it, but not understood it, and then people who have heard about it and are using it. Um, any thoughts? on the results? Yes, um, I would be particularly interested in the 5% uh, or percent that have heard about it and then haven't found it useful because, um, as I say, this is not a, 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 a list of commands. It is a common sense discussion of why it is important to do certain things and, get, uh, and thereby get a biologically relevant result. So um, I would be interested to know why people haven't found it useful. In terms of 50% are not having heard the Mikey guidelines, um, I'm not surprised by that because uh, many of us go around giving talks on Mikey and uh, this would be roughly in line um, with what I expect. If you had asked the same question um, a year ago, you would have found it was 80% of people that hadn't heard of Mikey. So um, I think the last year has seen uh, the breakthrough. Um, we have uh, 1,000 citations in the last year alone. And um, I suspect that as people begin to understand what Mikey is trying to do, um, you will see that if you, if you have the same poll in a year's time, that um, the 20% um, that adhere to them rigorously will have gone up to 50%, and the noise will have gone down to 20%. Okay. I guess it's a step in the right direction then. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bustin. Uh, let me now turn it over to our final speaker, Dr. Reginald Beer, who received a PhD in engineering from University of California, Davis for his research demonstrating the first real-time digital PCR in monodispersed droplets. He is uh, the Medical Diagnostics Initiative Leader at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he develops technologies for molecular diagnostic applications. His research in digital PCR, on-chip miniaturization, and selective microarray dehybridization focuses on improving existing diagnostic capabilities. Um, Dr. Beer, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak with us today. But before you give your talk, why don't we just quickly poll the audience to see if um, you know, they have been interested in digital PCR, but if they haven't taken the plunge, what has been their biggest concern? Um, 
did they not do it because of price, because of complexity, because of the analysis time, or um, you know, as we discussed earlier, the lack of perceived benefit for their application. So um, I would uh, encourage the audience to just take a few seconds, click on your response, because it's important as we discuss futuristic applications of PCR, we want to find out what exactly you perceive as the bottleneck here. All right, let's, um, let's uh, take a few seconds and then tabulate the results. All right. Uh, looks like it's a, you know a lot of things. Um, analysis time doesn't seem to be an issue, but there is a concern around price, complexity, and also lack of perceived benefit. Dr. Beer, does that surprise you? Uh, no, I'm going to basically. This is interesting to have this feedback right now before the talk because uh, uh -huh. can, can inform a little bit about what we talk about. Uh, we definitely are, I, I see reasons uh, with all of these, and I think this is an informative response from the audience. Uh, question, when we get to the discussion, can we come back to this slide at, at any chance, by any chance? Absolutely. I think we can do that, definitely. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and launch. Thank you for the introduction. Or was that, yeah, you're ready, right? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I'm going to dive right in. What is digital PCR? Digital PCR really emerged from what used to be called limiting dilution PCR, and really uh, what, what it is is it's the method where you take a complex sample. This would be a real sample that has different oligos or different target, uh, targets in it, DNA or RNA, that you actually want to amplify and detect, but you care about the target maybe a specific target you care about in the sample, and the other targets really just interfere. They rob reagents, or they can inhibit the amplification and detection of what you care about. So in digital PCR, we create what I would call binary partitions. And by binary, it means like you would think about it in the digital age, zero or one a copy of a target in each well or each droplet. You'll hear me uh, use wells and droplets somewhat interchangeably. Uh, our experience was always in droplet digital PCR, so um, so most of this talk is going to be around droplets, but um, but there are well-based or array-based methods for digital PCR as well that that are are performing the same function, if you will. So when you look at this slide, the middle of the figure, you see these partitions, maybe a, a, a moat around a castle, if you will, but you are separating out any other uh, uh, targets. And now you do your amplification because each one of these wells or droplets has, has all the reagents you need, all the nucleotides you need, all the enzyme you need. You do your amplification in each one of these uh, partitions. And now you have a clonal product. Everything that's produced is identical to the starting copy. And as you can see for the empty droplets, nothing was amplified because they didn't get any starting, any starting um, uh, uh, targets to amplify. So uh, it's this idea of you take a volume, you partition it, uh, or uh, discretize it into many, many, many different templates, which contain ideally one or zero uh, targets to start. Now we'll see when we get the statistics, it's not always one or zero. But the point is you don't have 0.5 targets or you know 1.6 targets. It is a, an integer, a whole integer, that goes into each one of those droplets. Comparing this to the bulk, uh, amplification that you can see on the top of this slide. Uh, you can see if we care about the red target in the center on the left-hand side, when we do our amplification, the signal from that target we cared about is absolutely swamped by a background because we're exponentially amplifying everything in the bulk. Um, we might be exponentially amplifying competing or interfering uh, uh, um, targets as well. and. Uh, this is why that uh, uh, you know not only the previous speaker talked about you know the the proper way to conduct PCR um, and to and to you know adhere to standards. Uh, we have to be careful. We'll get into this uh, on on the digital side as well. But uh, going to this quantific or this uh, excuse me this um, partitioning of your volume allows you to control the environment around the target you care about. You still have to have the primers you need to detect that target to amplify it uh, and probes, but, uh, but you've basically um, 
Let's see if this is following. You basically uh, have a very permissive amplification environment around that one droplet. Now the negative is that you have to interrogate every one of these droplets that you've created to get your answer. Whereas in bulk PCR, you don't have to do that, right? You have a photo detector or you run uh, the output of your uh, amplification on a gel and you only do that one time. In digital PCR, you have to interrogate, inter interrogate every uh, reaction volume. So around 2007, uh, in our laboratory, we developed the, uh, the first monodispersed droplet generator and, uh, and amplification, basically PCR instrument, uh, on chip where we generated a monodispersed emulsion. What that means is the same size. Um, and these were picoliter droplets that didn't vary, or they all vary a little bit, and that's one of the digital Mikey guidelines to actually specify that variance. But they, um, they, uh, they don't vary much from each other. They're as monodispersed as possible, and we actually uh, did uh, amplification on the chip and detection on the chip. And so we were able to compare uh, uh, basically cycle thresholds to uh, of, of a traditional qPCR approach to the Poisson model of digital PCR. So we'll talk to that now. Uh, when you look at digital PCR, the power in how accurately it can assess its titer is because you're working with a Poisson process. These are discrete processes where you have, as I mentioned before, integer, integer values um, for the amount of targets that go into any one well or droplet. If you look at these two figures, the one on the left is the one we'll start with. The um, average number of copies per droplets given by lambda is 1.0. And so if you think about this in a bulk sense, if I said you have a, you know, at least one copy of what you're going to amplify in your reactor, um, what percentage of reactors do you think are going to show amplification? You might think, well, let's say you've got a copy. It's going to be 100%. But it's actually not true because, um, because when you look along, and I've just clicked, the probability of amplification under a lambda of 1 is actually 63%. And it's because in this binary process or this integer-based process, some wells get two copies and some get three. So it is a random process. That's very key to Poisson. It's a random process with integer values of inputs. And so the equation that you see in the lower left-hand side is the Poisson equation. And looking to the right-hand figure, this is the answer you would get for, for um, a lambda of 0.5. 39% uh, of the uh, droplets or wells would support amplification. So now what we've done is we've transformed from looking at, at fluorescence intensity and, and deciding a threshold, right? to assess amplification and to compare to a standard curve to assess titer. Now we've moved away from that and we're assessing titer by percentage of wells or droplets that support amplification. So it's a fundamental shift from, from qPCR and, uh, and it's one that gives digital PCR its power. The, uh, the early results we had in 2007, we basically looked at the percentage of droplets we would expect to have successful amplification under Poisson models uh, with, the, with the amount of starting uh, genomic DNA in each single droplet. And we compared that to the percent droplets with successful amplification, which is the second row of this, uh, of this chart you see here. And what we saw was for seven copies per droplet, all of them supported amplification. All of them showed the fluorescence indicative of that. Um, for 0.4 copies, again, so not every droplet gets a copy, uh, we uh, saw 27% Poisson predicted a little bit higher. And then as you get very small, 0.06 copies, 5% um, of ours showed uh, amplification, whereas Poisson predicted 6. The last column is no template control, and, uh, and of course it's 0 and 0 there. The point is, is that uh, this showed that the Poisson model is, is applicable to this, uh, uh, to, to, to this methodology, to what we were doing in droplets. 
and, and it showed that we had good agreement with it. So we were very pleased with those results. We had a collaboration the following year with uh, Raindance where we used a uh, Raindance Technologies. We used a prototype system of theirs and we did a high throughput. I think this was the first high throughput comparison uh, qPCR uh, droplets uh, or on chip droplet generation and PCR cycling with um, with optical detection. And so we did a study of the quantitative PCR potential of this. And the importance here is unlike the previous study, uh, this had very high statistics. You'll note 16,000 droplets per data point. The data point are on the figure showing the, um, the triangles, and you see how well they compare to the blue curve, which is the Poisson curve. So basically, uh, we saw a methodology here where you could take any starting concentration, you could run it on an instrument, a digital instrument, if every well lit up, you'd say, okay, my starting concentration was too high, so you could take your sample and you could do a dilution, and then you could run it again until you got to Poisson values. Um, and if you're set up to optically detect in your original emulsion or your original uh, run anyway, you can do qPCR based on fluorescence of the individual wells in the standard way that, that everybody's used to. Uh, but once you got into the Poisson range where not every well was lighting up, then you could use this very accurate Poisson model for uh, tighter estimation. So it was very exciting. Um, however, uh, there are assumptions that are at play here that are not at play in bulk PCR, and we need to discuss those because they're very important. And, uh, and as you'll find, they make their way into the digital Mikey guidelines that um, that uh, Professor Buston was, uh, you know, was uh, discussing on the on the Mikey level, and also there's a publication I'm going to refer you to that um, that he is he is on. Uh, digital PCR assumptions: one, there's a large number of reactions. It's very important that we have a large number of reactions. It's one of the reasons limiting dilution PCR um, didn't really explode right out of the gate because uh, in the in the beginning they were hand pipetted into basically array plates, microarray plates, um, microarrays of, of wells, if you will. And so it's hard to get a large number of reactions. You'll notice the commercial instruments now go to a million, 10 million droplets. I mean, they want a lot of droplets or a lot of wells because they get better statistics that way. Secondly, you need a random distribution. I've already discussed that. You need independent segregation so you don't have concatenomers. Uh, every copy, copy that amplifies and gives a signal, that's an inherent assumption. And every copy is double-stranded and will amplify exponentially. So uh, these are all summarized and were very well presented uh, by Ross Haynes uh, from NIST in a paper. And, um, and this is listed in the resources at the end of my talk. So what are the capabilities of digital PCR? Well, first of all, uh, we start with PCR itself, which as we know and, and the first speaker uh, covered is very sensitive and it's very selective. Uh, it's sensitive because of the exponential amplification power of, of PCR, and it's selective because uh, it takes hybridization of primers that are specifically targeting regions of interest. Uh, so PCR itself is enormously powerful and useful for what we want to do. Um, digital PCR is a method to provide tighter accuracy in, in addition to or excess of what standard qPCR provides. Digital PCR allows you to, uh, in, a, in a, a more accurate, tighter estimation sense, detect mutations of rare targets in a complex background. And it does this because of the power of the Poisson statistics. And it does what I like to say is reduce amplification bias, the needle in the haystack. Uh, on the slide are two, um, two early digital PCR publications. Uh, basically, the limited dilution PCR goes back as far. The earliest uh, uh, reference I've found is 1988. Um, and then 1992 is the one that most people are more familiar with. The tools back then did not exist uh, like they do now. For, um, for generating a large number of wells or droplets. So limiting dilution uh, became digital. I don't know how it got that name, but digital PCR. And now when you, when you think about digital PCR, you think of running a reaction with millions or tens of millions of, uh, of droplets. So there are issues with this. Uh, anybody in the lab who does qPCR uh, can grab a 100 microliter or 25 microliter 
cuvette, and they can use syringes. They load their sample, they're done, it's easy, and it works very well. Um, when you do digital PCR, you're creating droplets typically or, or wells that are very small. And what we did was on the order of 10 picoliters, and so 100 microliters generated 10 million of those droplets. And so the only way to do this is, is through microfluidics, and that is forcing your sample and reagents through very small channels uh, as you generate your emulsion. For, uh, for this case, what happens is that up to half of your sample may be left in channel dead and swept volumes. And instrument manufacturers, developers are very savvy. They do their best to minimize uh, dead volume and swept volume, but they still exist. And this may be an issue for rare samples. In this slide, I've shown an example of uh, HIV load. If you have, say, 50 copies per milliliter and you have a, a real need to determine to detect that HIV is in the blood, uh, for 100 microliters that you're going to run on your instrument, uh, you'll be lucky if 30 or 40 percent of that volume comes from your sample, and the rest is going to be buffer and reagents. And then if you lose one or two copies to your sample wall, you'll be lucky, or to your channel walls, you'll be lucky to get one, even one on your instrument. And you're going to try to detect that one droplet that goes positive out of 10 million. So this can be very challenging. And it's why um, you see in the publications that for rare samples, precipitation of DNA uh, prior to digital PCR is frequently done. Um, the other thing that you have to deal with is generating these partitions takes time. It's another step in the process. It adds to the complexity over just standard batch PCR. But the benefits of digital PCR can be worth it. And um, uh, we'll get into some applications that really benefit from this method. Remember, though, this is still PCR. We still need standard reference materials. And how you do extraction, sample preparation, how you operate your instrument, what instrument you use, it still affects your results. And so standing on the um, foundation that was built by QPCR, uh, you know, all those earlier assumptions still apply. And, uh, and so you have to do this correctly. But if you do, you'll get the best titer information available. And again, low concentrations of targets in a complex background are really a sweet spot for this, uh, for this technology. So we're going to briefly cover, I know I've got to get through the time here, so we're going to briefly cover four different applications. One is, uh, these are all recent. I picked ones that were um, just recently in the press. Uh, this one was reported by PCR uh, Insider, let's see, Ben Budkiss in August. It's Chronix Biomedical. I think they used the BioRad QX100, but they quantified bloodstream levels of cell-free DNA from dying transplanted organ cells. This was interesting because the current state of the art in the laboratory was uh, as quoted in the, in the article was that uh, blood chemistry analytes were being used, but that by the time physicians could assess uh, modulation or variation in blood chemistry analytes, over 50% of the tar transplanted organs function may be lost. Digital droplet DD stands for droplet P digital PCR on the slide. Uh, droplet digital PCR was chosen over sequencing due to a faster turnaround time. Uh, another one, uh, mitochondrial DNA detection of a potential Alzheimer's biomarker. This was uh, recently reported in Annals of Neurology. Uh, detection of cell-free mitochondrial DNA in cerebral spinal fluid uh, of Alzheimer's patients. The claim is that the mtDNA depletion is a characteristic of Alzheimer's neurodegeneration. And, um, and that low levels of mitochondrial DNA in CSF can be a novel biomarker for earlier detection than protein-based methods. Well, if you've worked with uh, or you're familiar with medical samples, uh, cerebral spinal fluid is extremely pure fluid. The body does an excellent job of, of filtering that. And PCR inhibition is not a factor in it. So it's a very um, pristine sample to work with, if you will. It's also a sweet spot for digital PCR because in the study, they want single copy detection performance and absolute quantitation. So um, that's another example. Latent HIV infection monitoring is another one. Collect cell samples. Uh, you have, you're monitoring viral load of HIV in a patient and, and trying to monitor molecular remission and response probably to antivirals. Uh, DNA is extracted and precipitated to increase the concentration prior to PCR and the, um, I should say, digital PCR. And HIV DNA targets 
they're rare, but they're among a complex background of host cellular DNA. Uh, well, the proviral and aposomal DNA targets are well below the limits. This is a claim made in the paper at, uh, of qPCR, but uh, the authors state that the drop of digital PCR was particularly well suited to measuring the size of the HIV latent reservoir. This was in uh, the publication cited at the bottom. Another one is circulating DNA monitoring for cancer screening. Uh, patients, uh, plasma samples of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. They were able to simultaneously screen for multiple mutations from, the same, uh, from one sample. They were going after seven common mutations on the CRAS oncogene. Uh, and their quote was, it enables non-invasive and sensitive detection of circulating tumor DNA in blood. Uh, again, another, another application where it's very, very uh, timely and relevant to the research or the work being done to know the titer. It's not just a detection, but um, titer is very important in these application spaces. And, uh, and, and digital PCR does an, does an incredible job at doing that. Uh, but again, it has to be done correctly. And I'm going to mention a few of the digital Mikey guidelines. Uh, there need to be standards, so results are repeatable. Uh, information that needs to become standard. Uh, and there's a paper out on digital Mikey guidelines that I refer the viewers to. The total number of partitions, the partition volume variation, uh, we assume in our Poisson model that every volume is the same. Um, that's physically impossible, so there is variability, and that will affect the results. Total volume of partitions measured, and you know we're talking statistics here, total PCR reaction volume prepared. Uh, this gets to how much sample is actually run uh, through the instrument into wells versus lost or, or not run. And finally, controls for rare mutation analysis, just like any other system, positive controls are a very good thing to run. So with that, I'll just uh, close with these resources that I would recommend the viewer look at. There's, uh, if you go to the NIST.gov website, there's a great summary of digital PCR. I referred to it in the digital PCR assumption slide. But um, it not only covers the assumptions, but it does a very good job of explaining the method of digital PCR. There's the digital Mikey guidelines. Um, I've included a chapter that myself and John Lehman wrote in, uh, uh, on PCR troubleshooting optimization. It was a microfluidic emulsion PCR uh, topic that we wrote on. And then finally, the, at the lowest, if you want to look at the, the earliest record I found, others may have something that I'd like to hear from them. But uh, on limiting dilution PCR is the, um, the publication in Science from 1988. And that's it. Thank you, and look forward to some questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Beer. Um, very interesting talk, and it's uh, interesting to see how the field has progressed in 30 years. Um, maybe it's time for another quick poll. Um, if you've already tried digital PCR, how much did it improve your research? So I know that this may not apply to uh, all of you out there, but for those of you who have tried digital PCR, we would like to see if uh, you know you, if you are if you are going back to qPCR because you didn't find digital PCR useful at all, or did you find some benefit in performance that doesn't but it doesn't justify any extra investment, or were you in were you in the situation where you got some promising early results and you're using it more every day? Or are you totally committed and expect that most of your work will now use digital PCR in the future? So very keen to get your feedback because, again, this is, uh, this is the next wave of things to come. So take a few minutes, uh, seconds, actually, to just click, and here are the results. All right. Um, interesting. Uh, Dr. Beer, your thoughts? So, um, so this is this is interesting, and I really hope you'll send me these results. By the way, um, the uh, this goes to that question that you asked before on the start of the talk, which was, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to remember what the results were, but it was uh, it had to do with you know was it the right application, and um, although I can't really, uh, I, I don't have a way to reach into uh, conversations with the 41.5 percent. But my guess is that uh, um, 
the none were going back to qPCR as a reflection of uh, qPCR's ability to do exactly what they need for their application. Uh, as I mentioned in the talk, the um, the power of droplet or a digital PCR broadly uh, with a large number of reactions is the ability to get an extremely accurate titer um, uh, from a complex sample. And if the application for PCR is not, you know, if that's not what, what is needed, if PCR in that, those laboratories is used just to confirm a detection or just to amplify an amplicon, um, then it's not really in the sweet spot for digital PCR, and yet it is more expensive, um, and it's a newer methodology. So I'm not surprised, but a follow-up question would have been, uh, you know, were they were they operating in a application area, right? That is is really benefiting from the power of digital PCR. Um, that but probably follows. Have... No, go ahead. Um, the okay. second, the second line as well. Some benefit in performance, but doesn't justify the extra investment. And that, mm -hmm. you know, that would be interesting uh, to understand because there's an investment in time and in money uh, to use this technology. Right. Well, we are going to provide our attendees with all your email addresses. Um, and you know, for, from uh, the scientist viewpoint, this is just uh, the starting point to you know, get a discussion started between um, all of you. So if uh, we could just turn to the slide that gives all your contact information there. I would really encourage the attendees to reach out uh, to our speakers and get, get more into the nitty gritties of what it is that you're doing, why you feel like it is or it is not working for you, and what kind of improvements would you like to see. Perhaps you know, there is a way for them to help you out or at least direct you to the resources that can help you out. Um, but having said that, we have received a ton of questions from all of you, and I'm really grateful and appreciative of that. Um, I will try to you know, get to some of them, and uh, the rest of them, as I said, we will forward it along to our speakers, and hopefully, as and when they get some time, they will, they will reach out to you. But the first question, let me just use this as a first question, uh, Dr. Beer, because it talks about um, you know, what you were trying to say. So what... The question is, what is the, the difference in cost when you're talking about qPCR versus digital PCR in terms of that's, both that's, equipment and running, you know, r the running costs? Yeah, so that's a, that's a tough thing for me to answer because we don't, in our laboratory, we, we invented our own systems. Um, so we don't have a commercial system in our lab. Um, I think that when I go to conferences and I talk, you know, I see that, you can get very good uh, qPCR ready instruments uh, under twenty thousand dollars, and I think that droplet instruments are. Um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to misquote here, but I'm guessing the best uh, you're going to get is maybe fifty thousand dollars. I could be off though on that. So um, understand that uh, it's a newer technology, and there's more being done in that instrument because those emulsions have to be generated. And so I think just the instrument cost is more expensive, uh, and depending on the format, whether it's a um, an array-based method, the consumable may be more much more expensive than just qPCR, mm -hmm. the droplet instruments as well. There's there's more there's more technology, there's more hardware involved, so it is a more expensive uh, application space, and that's one of the reasons that you need the user needs an application that requires the performance probably to justify that difference, but. Uh, but I don't, I, short answer, I don't have a quick metrics for, for them on okay. cost differential. All right. But um, at least we have a starting point. Um, Dr. Muller, there's a question that came up for you earlier, um, and if you're still there available to address it. Um, it seems that you have uh, you know, stated in the past that you did not feel that PCR can be utilized uh, for HIV detection. So. What view do you take today, especially given the you know the, the progress and uh, the the diagnostic applications that Dr. Beer talked about? Where do you see PCR and its role in um, HIV detection? Well, you know, I never said that a, that HIV was not somehow magically immune to PCR detection. It's obviously is a piece of DNA and RNA and, and at some point and it, it is detectable. The question, only question that I ever ask and what I guess I got terribly misquoted was is, is what is the significance of finding this virus 
in small amounts in people's blood. And, and, and that's a medical kind of a question, and it, it's turned into a, an emotional kind of question, and similar to whether we should bomb Syria for some reason. It's like it's a, it's a crazy thing that scientists are not able to, you know, disagree with each other with reasonable sort of evidence and compare it and see, come to some sort of conclusion. But, in fact, in the HIV field, that has proven to be completely not possible. So I would say PCR can detect DNA and RNA fine, mm -hmm. and, it, and it is a matter of what do you, and how do you interpret the detection of it? Is, is that's the big deal? That's a medical question. It's sort of not not a PCR question. Is that a reasonable? Yes. No. Absolutely. And I think forums like this that's why are important because sometimes people just read excerpts from interviews or you know um, see you quoted in some articles, and sometimes it's really hard. Uh, to put things in perspective, or things can be taken out of context. So I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, providing that clarification. Um, here's a, que a question for Dr. Bustin, um, and um, I don't know, maybe this referred to some specific um, slide in your talk, but how many copies can you actually uh, do in five minutes? Does that make sense? Oh, um, I presume what, 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 what the question is, um, can, can we do 40 cycles? And yes, we can. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, another digital PCR question, Dr. Beer. Is there an efficiency issue in digital PCR example? Uh, for example, can you amplify different lengths of amplicons using digital PCR? Yes. I, I don't think there's, there's any issue with um, amplicon lengths. And we... In our laboratory, we we did multiple amplicon lengths. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd say that's a that's a non-issue. Okay. okay. And um, well, this is an interesting question, and it's not directed to anybody in particular. But I would, you know, if you have feedback, please share it because as whole genome sequencing becomes cheaper, uh, do you think PCR techniques will still be needed? Um, and there's another question that says, you know, along similar lines. Will PCR have to make way for a next-gen sequencing? Um, your thoughts on that? So um, I, I, probably all three of us speakers will have thoughts on that. I will just answer that um, that uh, right now uh, uh, when you do sequencing, every the dirty little secret is you amplify with PCR before you sequence. So um, I don't see PCR going away. Uh, if you don't, if you truly wanted to sequence just one copy of something. The stochastic nature of that, uh, the error that you would be prone to receive, uh, would be pretty, pretty uh, probably abhorrent to the community. So, um, so I would say that uh, I don't see PCR going away. I think it's a foundation to all these technologies. Okay. Well, anyone else wanted to chime in? Well, well I would say it, it, it isn't just the cost with an explanation sequencing; it's the complexity, and mm -hmm. um, this is where qPCR will always score. And I think you just, um, you're addressing different questions. So I, I think qPCR has its place and it will ex expand its place and next generation sequencing will also have its place and it will just be used for different things. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to the next question then. Um, what is preferred in qPCR for accuracy? Um, should you be using an internal standard or an external standard? Um, and uh, Dr. Buston, why don't you address that? Um, well, this is the age-old question. Um, I think yeah. an internal standard is, is preferable, um, and um, it, it has to be that they have to be multiple uh, uh, standards because, obviously, uh, depending on what you're trying to show, if you're, showing, if you're trying to show a huge difference in, in, in expression levels, then it isn't quite as important, but most people seem to want to show fairly small changes, and then you have to be certain that um, whatever internal standards you're using um, are, are, are less variable than the, the, what you're trying to actually show. And so uh, internal standards, multiple internal standards, ideally validated internal standards are at the moment the, the way to go forward. This doesn't mean that there are other things on the horizon, but that's at the moment the, the, the best answer I can give you. Okay. Right. And uh, Dr. Beer, did you have anything um, to address on the digital PCR side, or is it pretty much the same, along the same lines that Dr. Buston talked about? Um, yeah, I think that I, I think that uh, uh, that he covered it nicely. Okay, all right. Maybe it's it's time to go um, and take a quick poll about 
you know, what is the most challenging aspect of PCR today? I think we're all curious to find that. We, ha we each sort of have our own biases, but let's see if we can send that poll out. Um, it should be up in a, in a couple of seconds. So what do you think is, you know, the most challenging aspect for you today? Is it really the extraction method, the assay design? Is it sample handling and storage, sample contamination, or is it the final step, the data reporting and analysis? Um, again, just take a few seconds to think about it and click on the, uh, the, the circle right next to the answer. And um, let's see if we can tabulate the results here because, again, I think this is what this webinar was about, to try to address some of your challenges. So it looks like 43% are still facing challenges with assay design. And then there is a you know, good chunk of people uh, who have data reporting issues and also issues with the extraction itself. So does that come as a surprise to any, any of you? Um, it, kind of it, it comes as a slight surprise to me. I would expect okay. the data reporting and analysis to be by far the most challenging aspect because um, assay design is actually not that difficult, um, and there, there's lots of information available as to how to go about assay design. But data reporting and analysis is uh, extremely complicated, and uh, uh, so I am surprised, yes. I'm not surprised that extraction method or handling of samples is um, uh, certain extraction methods and quality control, I think, is an important issue. But yes, uh, and data analysis does surprise me. Okay, and Dr. Beer, your thoughts? Um, it's funny, we all have our own perspectives. Yeah. Uh, I, def I definitely get uh, uh, Stephen's point, but I'm also surprised that uh, the sample handling and processing is not a little bit higher because, uh, you know, it comes from just the perspective of where people, uh, where, where people are basically, you know, finding their headaches and, and when we look at samples that we would want to address medically, dealing with blood or, or you know, body fluids or other medically relevant sample media that I won't go into, um, uh, the headaches and a lot of thought has to go into how you acquire and prepare your sample for PCR. So um, I'm actually surprised a little bit the other way, but I do, um, okay. do agree with, uh, with the previous comment. And I would say that when people go to publish, that last entry becomes very important to them. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask Dr. Mullis uh, what his thoughts are because I'm wondering if things uh, have changed since when, you know, back in the days when he was doing PCR. Dr. Mullis, uh, what do you see in these results? Well, you know, I think that it's always, and it has nothing to do with PCR in particular, but mm -hmm. when you're working with laboratory type uh, systems and, and data that's generated in them, you have to keep your head and understand, don't get lost totally in the details and all the new bangled stuff that's going on, but you have to just, you know, being a scientist does require some thought once in a while, so it's not just a whole bunch of data. Agree. Okay. I, don't, I don't know how to say that in a nice way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pragmatic. Uh, but in terms of assay design, perhaps, you know, people, maybe there's a lack of uh, guidance or, um, you know, people don't know what resources, because you did mention, Dr. Bustin, that there are a lot of resources available for assay design. Perhaps people are not aware of it, or even if they are aware of it, they don't quite know how to interpret it and then apply it to their specific assay. Well, uh, well the ironic thing is that um, uh, the uh, assay or the um, oligo design or the oligo houses, such as BioSearch, for example, and others, mm -hmm. they are extraordinarily helpful. So all you need to do is actually phone them and talk to somebody, and they will be very helpful and help you in designing assays. And that is certainly a very good way of doing it. They all have very good websites. They all have very good programs online where you can design assays. And then you have the in individual you can talk to. So I would certainly encourage people to talk to the oligo houses because they are a great source of information. Okay. Well, that's... Uh and that's certainly easy to do, so I would encourage people to do that as well. Um, all right, thank you for taking part in the polls. Um, let's put uh, our speaker contact information back on there so that you know how to, uh, how to get in touch with them. I think we have unfortunately reached uh, the end of our webinar time. It has been a, uh, 
extremely interesting webinar. I mean, the talks have been very uh, fascinating and, and informative, and the audience participation has been fantastic. So I want to thank everyone um, you know, for taking the time to be with us and actually making this a very interactive event. The webinar, as I mentioned earlier, will be archived on the scientists' website, and the link to the archive will be sent to all of you in the next few days. But again, a quick reminder, you cannot download any slides from our website, so you will have to reach out to our speakers. And um, my sincere thanks to all our speakers. I cannot thank them enough because this is such a complex topic, um, and there, is, there was so much work done here by each of them, and to try and sort of condense all those years of research into such short talks, is, it's never easy. So I appreciate you doing that. And thank you to our sponsor, Biosearch Technologies, for making this event possible. And a special thank you to our uh, events manager, Kaylee Thomas. Uh, I know she's been uh, working frantically behind the scenes to keep things running very efficiently. So thank you, Kaylee. And uh, don't forget to check the scientist's website for uh, the webinar archive. And stay tuned, because we are always posting uh, announcements for new webinars that are uh, going to be uh, you know, coming. And there's tons of other information on there that you'll find useful. So once again, thank you for sharing the time with us. And until next time, goodbye, everyone, and good luck.